Welcome to Critical Role Demystified. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we break down the lessons we can learn as GMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 44, The Sunken Tomb. And boy oh boy, this is going to be a big one. Also, today, the day this video is going up, is American Thanksgiving, so... If that's a thing you care about, then I hope you have a happy one. As a note, this episode of Critical Role was delayed a couple of weeks, partially because a bunch of the cast was sick and one cast member was traveling, which means, fun fact, this episode now lines up with the one year anniversary of Critical Role. The delay also means there's kind of a manic energy at the table as they're all just so excited to be back. As the game opens, the group discusses all the information they got from all their allies, and Grog reveals that his uncle has the Titan Stone Knuckles. His uncle is also not a good dude, so Grog is in no rush to go get them, but at least the party kind of knows where those knuckles are. But in the meantime, the party is currently very close to where the Deathwalker's Ward is hidden. That's the armor of the Raven Queen's champion, which is somewhere beneath a nearby body of water called the Marrowglade Lock. So that's the next stop. Before they leave, they try to research the armor to see if there's anything they need to know. And this is how Vex winds up in an antique bookstore, haggling with a merchant over a 30 gold book that might contain the information she's looking for. The scene goes on for a while, but thanks to a poor role, she ultimately actually has to pay full price. Oof. We made it through together. But thanks to this book, she's able to do some research into the former champion of the Raven Queen, the guy who was buried in the armor. And what she learns is... <laughs> Well, here's today's first lesson. One of the highest uh, of the, the Order of the Raven Queen uh, that fought in her name was named Purvan. <laughs> yeah, he was. Purvan? <laughs> Purvan. P-U-R-V-A-N. Last name, Pedabear. <laughs> We're running out of good names, aren't we? We finally got into the end of your list of good names. Oh, you guys are cruising to a TPK today. Not on the end of Oh, yeah, this is great. So yeah, here's a lesson. Say your NPC names out loud at home before you say them at the table. Like, I don't need to say anything else about this one, do I? Feels like this lesson kind of stands on its own. Anyway, they learn that Pervon was laid to rest in a tomb, but since the worship of death gods thrives in wartime and dwindles in peacetime, eventually there weren't enough acolytes to maintain the tomb. Which is a really cool detail to include. It has an internal logic and tells us a lot about how religion works in Matt's world, but also does a great job of justifying how a legendary hero's tomb could become an abandoned dungeon. There's definitely gonna be ghosts there. Nope. Kishaw? Yeah. Do your holy shit when we go there, all right? I will you absolutely do my holy shit. <laughs> you don't want to see the god, but we'll do the rest of the holy shit. We'll be fine. We in the biz call that foreshadowing. Also, Zara gifts Grog with a moon hammer she created, and he tries to test it on Vax, but due to some wacky role-playing nonsense, Grog thinks he kills Vax. It's a very funny scene, mainly because Travis totally commits to it. Oh! oh I killed him! He's <laughs> all over me! His bits are all over me! We've talked about it before, but the way Travis plays Grog is never not enjoyable to me. He's so good at committing to the bit and committing to what his not very intelligent character would do in any given situation. The party uses Wind Walk to turn into mist and fly to the lock. Along the way, Zara reassures a very anxious trinket, which uh, leads to this exchange. What's happening? It's all right, Ty. We're going to a lock. It's going to be great fishing for I will follow. We can oh. talk in Mistful? Uh, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I'll give a shit. Your right. fun is wrong! Your fun is wrong! This isn't just a goofy moment. It's actually a pretty revealing clip. See, Matt had ruled previously that the party couldn't talk in mist form. I suspect he drew this conclusion from the fact that the spell says the only action you can take in mist form is to dash or try reverting to your normal form. While talking obviously is not an action, I could see the argument that since you can't cast spells, then you probably just can't talk, since some spells only require a single word to cast. It's not really written that you can't speak, but it's his interpretation and it's his game, so that's how it works. But here, maybe because he forgot, or maybe because this is just a fun roleplay moment that also makes sense for the characters, or maybe because he doesn't want to tell a guest that they can't do that fun roleplay moment that they just had, even if it really doesn't matter that much. But for whatever reason, he hand waves it away. I honestly think that part of the issue is that he wants this cast to get to the dungeon 
ASAP. They only have so much time tonight, and they have to finish this dungeon tonight, since their guest stars have already kind of waited a couple of weeks more than they planned to, they can't keep coming back. They also started this stream late due to technical issues, and even still, this game winds up running for five hours, so it ends up being a pretty late night. So for all those reasons, I think he's right to just wave it off and say, sure, fine, you can talk while you're made of mist, who cares right now? But what was that joke Will and Mary said? Well, that's a reference to the Q&A they did the week before. See, they had to postpone this game, so instead of having a normal episode, they did a Q&A with the folks who could attend. That was Matt, Marisha, Travis, Will, and Mary. After the Q&A, they ran their first Battle Royale, which kicked off that very fun tradition. We've discussed the uh, final Vox Machina Battle Royale before on this channel. I plan to talk about more in the future. But in that Q&A, they referenced some knee-jerk reactions of some online D&D fans whose instinct is to just admonish anybody for not playing by the rules precisely as written. AKA, the people who basically declare, your fun is wrong. Now, Matt brought it up in that episode to make the point that the audience for CR is mostly really wonderful, this sort of comment is very rare. But even so, I do think we can see the impact of those pedantic comments on the way he plays his game. In the first episode, Matt told the audience that there were a bunch of house rules and they were basically just having fun. Throughout the first couple of arcs, Matt really wasn't that worried about sticking to the fidelity of 5e's rules. But that changed over time, and he started enforcing the rules a lot more strictly. Now there are a bunch of reasons Matt started running a game that was closer to rules as written, not the least of which was to try to correct for the party's buckwild balance issues. But some of that also does seem to have come from pressure from people online. And while you and I might not be streaming our games for the world to see, we can still run into a similar reaction when we're trying to navigate advice online. There are people who will try to hold you to exactly how it's written on the page. But honestly, when you're in the moment, it's sometimes okay just to hand wave something as Matt does here and just say, it's fine, I'm not gonna worry about this right now. Because the game is just that. It's a game. Rules are important in games. It's good to have rules. But they're not the most important thing. And consistency is also important. Your players should know how the game works, and if you take it easy on them and change things so the characters won't lose without really having that conversation with the cast, then that's going to have some negative effects as well. But consistency also isn't the most important thing. The most important thing is to make sure your players are having a good time. Sometimes following rules and especially remaining consistent can really help that a lot because it helps establish a baseline to keep everybody on the same page, which helps cut down on frustration. So consistency and rules can help the game be more fun. <laughs> if that wasn't the case, then people wouldn't sell 200 to 400 page rule books for these games. But if you're in the moment and something doesn't feel right, then just do what you want to do instead. The most important word in the comment, your fun is wrong, is of course the word fun. If you all are having fun, then do what you want and don't worry about rules as written. The party arrives at the lock and they end up taking a long rest because they're being very cautious. They know this isn't going to be as safe as it seems, but they also don't really know how they're going to get into an underwater tomb. So they take a long rest and Vex has Trinket sleep between Vax, sorry, Cash and Keyleth. Just to make sure, you know, nobody muscles in on her brother's woman. Hated that, hated saying that. On the first watch, the party sees some wild owl bears foraging. It honestly never occurred to me that owlbears might be nocturnal, but I like that detail a lot. On the second watch, Vax asks Percy how he's doing, since the Orthax event was not that long ago. But Percy's got a sense of purpose now. He thinks fate is on their side. And he encourages Vax to go after what he wants, aka Keyleth, aka Romance. And then they see a huge bird sail through the sky. And it's the rock that they sent here, the one that was plaguing the farms near Amon. He made it here safe and sound. This is a really terrific way to remind the players not only of the events in their past, but specifically about one of their former accomplishments, a victory they earned by choosing non-violence. They were right to put their trust in finding a peaceful resolution because it worked out well for everybody. And given all the setbacks Vox Machina has experienced lately, this is a really wonderful way to remind the party of something they got right. Scanlan and Cash take the final watch, and Scanlan tells Cash he knows what's going on. And then he gets it completely wrong. Listen, Vax doesn't fly that way, I don't think. I know you've been eyeing him pretty good. But... Um, huh? <laughs> Vax, I'm just, I'm just looking out for you, brother. He's, uh, <clears throat> he's not available for you. I. What else do your keen eyes perceive? <laughs> incredible. Just in. Can I give you a bit of advice? Please, please do. <laughs> you know, you have to follow your heart. So, if, if you do have feelings for the lad, you at least have to tell him, even if he won't return them to you. Mm. It's funny, I've been wanting to have a conversation with him for quite a while now. Oh, I... We have a lot to discuss. Oh, yes. What about? Oh, you know, this and that. Feelings, as you would call them. Oh, Romance, yes. as you would say. <laughs> you are so in touch with them. I know. <laughs> it's not often you meet a 
man like that. He so is... you run towards him. Some would say with your spear out. <laughs> TMI, my friend. <laughs> TMI. That is funny. Yes. <laughs> well, you're right. We do have quite a bit to talk about. Yeah, we have another two and a half hours on this watch. I didn't just play that clip because I think it's really funny. Although, also, yes. But this is something Sam does a lot. There's a subplot in Campaign 2 that I won't spoil because it involves a pretty big relationship from that party, but in a similar fashion, Sam has his character completely misread the subtext between the characters who are pining after each other. Or in this case, misread Cash's awkwardness with Keyleth and perhaps jealousy toward Vax as romantic pining toward Vax. And sometimes, Sam is just being a troll. But in his weird way, he's in his own unique way, what he's doing is also being an extremely supportive fellow player, and he's showing that in a few ways. Let me explain. First, he's showing that he, as a player, is actively listening and following the romantic subplots. This matters. I've played in a lot of games where when some players are talking one-on-one, -on -one, the others just wander away. Which is fine if everybody's on the same page about that, but in the games like Critical Role and in the games I run, those conversations matter just as much as the more plot-heavy stuff, and I prefer everybody to show each other some respect and listen during those scenes. And so this scene demonstrates, yeah, Sam has been listening. Second, he's showing that he's willing to have his character look like a fool to avoid metagaming, which I think helps demonstrate best practices for the rest of the group. It helps to show how avoiding metagame can actually be more fun than whatever potential benefit you stand to get from metagaming. Obviously not all forms of metagaming are the same, I made a whole video about that, but this is a useful lesson no matter what form it takes. Third, he's yes-anding and demonstrating how the party can interact with a two-person subplot and amplify it. Which actually brings me to number four, he's adding a complication to that romantic subplot. The same kind of complication you might get in a sitcom. And that's just a really fun way to bring a totally different sense of narrative into your game. See, when we run D&D and play D&D, we spend a lot of time emulating action movies and fantasy books and RPG video games and other things that have really clear points of reference when we play. But as we see here, there are lots of other genres that we can evoke in our games, including the misunderstandings of broad comedies. But something like that actually works better when it's player initiated, as it is here. Fifth, he's role-playing Scanlan's low wisdom. It's hardly a secret that Cash and Keyleth have some awkwardness around each other, but Scanlan has a minus two wisdom modifier. That means he's also got a pretty weak insight role. And while I don't think this is the reason Sam came up with this scene, it does work in that context and serves as a useful perspective for how you can play low wisdom characters without being disruptive at the table. Sixth, he's being a generous scene partner. He knows Wilfred L is playing a sarcastic, constantly irritated character, so Sam is presenting Scanlan doing something ridiculous and giving Will a chance to respond as Cash and have some fun playing someone who is sar sarcastic and irritated in a safe, confined, fun space. This is like the shoot your monks idea of giving your players a chance to go do the cool thing they created their character to do, but in the context of role playing. And seventh, it's just a good solid joke and Sam is a troll so it just works well. Also, it's very funny that Scanlan says he doesn't think Vax flies that way. Scanlan, he flirts with Gilmore all the time. He's the first canonically confirmed bisexual character on Critical Role. What are you even talking about? In the morning, the party parts the waters and starts clearing rubble to get into the tunnel, and Vex and Vax almost sink into quicksand on the lake bed. And nobody really makes a big deal of the fact that they almost died. It's actually kind of played for laughs. I honestly think the energy at the table is just a bit funky, uh, probably because of the late start and how late it's getting. They're just getting a little bit goofy. They dig through some rocks and get into the dungeon and start exploring. Uh, they set off and disarm a scythe trap, and I really like the way Matt describes the disarming. There's a button inside the groove the scythe slid out of, so they really only have a second to reach in and click it before the scythe hits them. We don't do that enough. We tend to have our players roll to spot traps and roll to disarm traps, but rarely do we describe what disarming the trap looks like in advance. Matt doesn't just say, okay, you want to disarm this trap, roll for sleight of hand or thieves tools or whatever. He tells them how the trap works in the world of the game. So now, when they try to disarm it, they can describe how they're doing that, which invites more creativity. But also because they basically know how it works, they have a better sense of the consequence of any potential failure. It's a great approach that I could stand to learn a lot more from in my own games. But honestly, the concept of traps in D&D is such a big, broad topic with a lot of question marks, and it's something we'll have to do a whole other video about. We'll come back to that another day. They find a band of fish people and drop into initiative in their very first ever Dwarven Forge map. So yeah, it's initiative, so here are some highlights. At first, this fight is a cinch. These fish dudes are simple Kuatoa. They're soft and squishy, and honestly, they don't really stand a chance against eight level 12 adventurers. Which is why, just a couple of turns into the first round of combat, Matt introduces the real challenge. There is this oh no. echoing mutter, this almost burbling that seems to rise up 
behind Akima and Percy at this point. Oh shit. Uh, oh shit. You glance you over your back? shoulder into the darkness below, the, oh, the collapsed God. tunnel. No. And what little bit of light you see coming through, you see something fleshy rise up from underneath. Fleshy. Oh shit. Um, oh, it's it's glistening in places, and uh, immediately a cold shudder crawls down your back as you see a series of appendages release, each with a gleaming eye at the end of each one. No. One giant eye rises up. No! 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 What is that? No! 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 This, this is why I love introducing the game to new players. A year ago, Travis Willingham had never heard of a Beholder and really didn't think it was a big deal once he learned what it was. Jump to now and what's his reaction when Matt puts down a tiny piece of plastic on the board? Oh, fuck. Oh, no. oh, no. oh, wow. You weren't prepared. Also, look at Will's face. He's still really new to D&D, and unlike Mary, I don't think he watches every Critical Role episode every week. So all he knows is a big new monster is on the field, and everyone else at the table just freaked out so hard. He knows he's in the deep end right now, but he's having so much fun. Not cool. Not cool. Happy anniversary, you dicks. <laughs> and now this fight really kicks off. So here are the highlights. This time, when Percy uses his headshot ability on the Beholder, it won't have that same wildly powerful effect it did against Kavarn, where it gave everybody advantage on all their saves against the Beholder's eye rays. That was just a quick solution Matt came up with at the time to give Percy some way for his ability to make a difference, but this time, sorry, Matt's going to play it according to Raw, because his solution made the fight way too easy last time. I know, I just talked about how playing rules as written doesn't matter that much, but when your goal is to find a way to challenge the party, then... Sometimes it's best to be a hard ass. Lady Kima is telekinetically lifted up and dropped into the pit that the Beholder emerged from. They hear her hit the ground hard, but she's alive. Keyleth turns into an earth elemental and phases into the wall, but because she can't phase through worked stone, like bricks and stuff, there's not a lot of places for her to come back out. Which, thankfully, Matt isn't just declaring. He's not using DM fiat to make it so she can't do anything cool. He can back up his work by pointing to the board because, look, Dwarven Forge. Anyway, throughout the fight, she tries to emerge from above the Beholder and tackle it like she did with Kavarn, but she just rolls terribly, so it takes a while before she's able to break through the stones in the ceiling. As one of the Beholder's lair or legendary actions, it's actually able to conjure an eye that appears on the wall and fire an eye ray out of that eye. That's pretty cool and a fun way to mess with the heroes who tried to keep their distance from the Beholder. That plus the Beholder's hovering ability actually does provoke a lot of movement from the party as it floats around the ceiling like a blimp of doom. Matt doubles down by having tentacles come out of the walls, restraining people who have been cowering around the corners, basically punishing them for playing it safe. I made a video about this recently and funnily enough, the thumbnail I use is from the cartoon adaptation of this fight. That's a fun detail I definitely did on purpose and not just a total coincidence. But I think it's really common for D&D encounters to wind up with everybody basically locked down in the same locations for most of the fight. Honestly, more often than not, that's because people just don't want to risk taking attacks of opportunity. And the fewer enemies there are on the field, the more the party can surround them and gang up on them. So even if they wanted to risk four or five attacks of opportunity, they just can't break free from the mob. But Beholders can just float over everybody and keep repositioning to target as many enemies as possible. Additionally, the Beholder's eye ray cancels magic, its central eye, so that's yet another way to coax players to keep moving so they don't lock into one spot. And honestly, the cast is already in a good position, no pun intended, to incorporate movement into their games more than I tend to in most of mine, because Critical Role always uses a battle map. While it would be ridiculous to claim that they never have fights where people don't move that much, that's just obviously not true. They do think about positioning a lot thanks to their use of battle maps for every encounter. And as Matt continues to use Dwarven Forge for more elaborate encounter locations, and especially as Vox Machina continues fighting higher level enemies, movement in combat will continue to become a necessity in this group. Scanlan uses Big B's hand to fastball special grog into the Beholder, which is pretty epic. Keyleth finally breaks through the ceiling and knocks the Beholder down a peg. And of course, continuing the tradition of guest characters getting the kill, Zara gets the how do you want to do this against the Beholder. And all in all, they didn't suffer too badly. Kima took a hell of a fall, and Cash almost got turned to stone. He was one saving throw away from becoming a statue. But thankfully, when the Beholder died, the petrification effect ended on Cash before it could permanently freeze him. Besides that, I mean, Vex took a bunch of necrotic damage from one of the eye rays, but otherwise things weren't so bad. 
In the aftermath, there's a bit of chaos as the party starts trying to do everything they need to do. Vax starts rappelling down into the hole to rescue Lady Kima. As Grog pulls her up, Vax fishes through the bones at the bottom of the pit. He finds only six gold. If you're not familiar with Megaphone Man, he's a fantastic YouTuber who is watching through Campaign 1 for the first time and offering a ton of insight, and he's been fairly critical of not just the cast's habit to try to scrounge gold off of every corpse when they're usually getting quest rewards in the five figures. Like, who cares about six gold, really? But pointing out that this not only happens because of the party cares about loot, but because Matt rewards his behavior by including gold every time they search any body. But because that's the behavior Matt is tacitly encouraging, that's what Vax is doing. Meanwhile, back in the chamber they just fought the Beholder in, the others open up a sarcophagus to reveal a corpse in black leather armor with raven imagery on it. The Deathwalker's Ward. Oh, and this body also has some very fine jewelry at its sides as well. As soon as Laura hears that, she describes that Vex, who is at the lip of the pit waiting for Vax to come back up, well, now she leaves Grog's side to go help search the sarcophagus. Now, everybody is talking over each other, and this is something we've seen before in the aftermath of a battle as they try to raid the domain. Everybody has something that they want to do, and there's no real order of operations. This is exacerbated by the fact that there are eight people at the table for the first time in months, and this is their first game back in a couple of weeks, and there's been a heightened energy at the table already. But all this means that Matt asks Laura to roll an investigation check to search for traps, and then before she gets a chance to roll it, Talison describes how he's removing the leather armor from the body. And if these had been any of the other things that people were doing at the same time, like Scanlan taking a healing potion, or Keyleth harvesting beholder pieces, or Grog pulling Vax up, it wouldn't matter. But in this case, Percy starts to remove the armor before Vex has a chance to check it for traps. Can we perception check the tomb and, and see if it's safe to grab shit out of it? Weeks sure, go ahead and make an investigation check. Hey, Vax, you got that rope yet? <laughs> I'm going to very, uh, hold on. very gently, I'm removing Lift. the the leather armor. Yeah, I the, am. Geez, well, how much have we Okay. Uh, Whoa! I need Vex, I need Percy, and I need Trinket to all make dexterity saving throws. Oh, oh snaps. Yep. Evil shit. Sorry. Oh. One. One. <gasps> for dead. me. Why do you roll that big? Instant <laughs> death. I rolled well on it before. Six for Trinket. <laughs> this is a good night, you guys. Uh, did I find any loot in the uh, bodies of the... The losers, the little guys? Uh, you find a bunch of shitty spears, um, oh, crappy leather, and leather. Uh, throw them all about 12 gold pieces. Yeah. As we discussed, we know Sam is a good listener, so I think the fact that he asked this question now, right as they're resolving the effects of a trap, isn't an indictment of him as a player, it's a reflection of the fact that the group's attention is scattered. Even now, there's still a lot they're all trying to do. And I wonder if the reason he asked the question now as they're rolling is because it was a quick and easy answer to get out of the way before the next thing. But whether or not that's why he asked, I'm almost certain that's why Matt didn't say something like, uh, just a minute, and pause in, on giving Scanlan's answer, which is probably what I would have done. And I've got a bonus video actually coming out about that on Sunday, uh, so stay tuned for that because I have a lot to say about that. But in this case, Matt makes a wise move. He gets Sam's answer out of the way so he can move on to the next thing, resolving the results of the trap. 21. You manage, as, as you reach out and grab for the armor, as your fingers touch it, there's this vibration, and it seems like the shadows, the nearby shadows in the corners, seem to reach up towards your hands. You pull back in time, but you and Trinket notice a little too late as there's a burst of uh, death, a burst of, of death energy that just what? bursts out for a 10 foot radius around the entire sarcophagus. You avoid it. Both you and Trinket uh, are dead. Suffer 56 points of necrotic damage. I'm unconscious. <gasps> Does that Trinket? bring you below zero? Yeah. Vex's body falls and hits the stonework, and you look over as you see her eyes stare up, the last bit of air escaping from her lungs as the life drips out of her form. Oh shit. <laughs> what? <sighs> What's going on? One roll. One roll changed everything. The time codes for this full scene are on screen, but let's recap the immediate aftermath. Everybody scrambles to Vex's side. Zara feeds her a healing potion, but it has no effect. But watch this moment. Since Vax wasn't in the room when this went down, Matt resolves the effects of the potion, or the lack of effect, and then refocuses the scene to highlight Vax's perspective. The healing potion has no effect, and as you go to her, you can already feel the, the clutch to her skin. Her body is instantly cold from the necrotic blast. Kasha! You glance over Ow. at the sudden, intense 
energy of the room and see your sister lying cold and lifeless on the ground being cradled by Zara. What the fuck happened? Cash, cash, cash. I can raise the dead. As Vax pours another healing potion in Vex's mouth, Will confirms that Cashaw has Revivify prepared. But here's something we talk about a lot in this series. Matt is very good at honoring his players' choices. Sometimes it means just acknowledging what they do in the session. Other times, it's about playing off of important stuff in their backstory. And Will Friedle made the choice to create a cleric who is bonded to an evil goddess of death. And Matt rewards that choice by laying out the potential stakes. Uh, you reach into your pouch and pull out uh, a bit of, uh, mm -hmm. of clustered diamonds in your hand that you keep just in case for such a circumstance. And as you uh, place them out, you sprinkle them across her chest, kind of pushing Vax a little bit away, knowing that you need the concentration on this. Um, at which point you pull up the symbol and this type of, of magic, life and death magic, draws a little closer than you feel comfortable with Vesh. Um, and you realize at this moment that you're going to have to make the choice to possibly call her attention forth. Call well, whose attention forth? Oh, shit. What are you hesitating for? Do it! Do it. Whatever the Shh. fuck you're going to do, do it! She could destroy everything. Do it. What do you mean? She could destroy you. What do you mean? Who's she? The dragons are going to be the least of your fears if she comes back. That's what I mean. Kasha, you're running out of time. Who's she? Gosh. I'm going to bring her back. Okay. So the party enters their first on-screen resurrection ritual. Now, in Rules is Written D&D, a revivify spell just works if you've got the material components. As long as the spirit is willing to return to the body, there's no risk of failure. But as the party learned from Pike's death, Matt feels that more should be done to earn a resurrection when a party member dies. There should be a chance of failure, otherwise death feels too trivial. This is something a lot of GMs adjust in their games, and this is honestly a larger topic that we'll talk about in Monday's video about the many ways that you can handle death in your game. Today we're just talking about Matt's approach. Now, at the end of the episode, he acknowledges that the only reason that they didn't have to do a ritual like this for Grog back in episode 11 was because they were in the middle of a Beholder fight. So, in a couple of different ways, Matt's approach to resurrection spells will be refined a bit later in the campaign. In the future, a ritual like this would not be used for Revivify, but there would still be a check required. But in general, this ritual reflects what Matt is aiming for with his approach to death in his campaign. This is like the platonic ideal of how Matt handles in-game death. So let's break it down. First, I want to highlight how Matt narrates the ritual, putting a lot of emphasis on the visuals of the magic. So, um, we're going to do a quick ritual skill challenge as part of this uh, Revivify enchantment. So, as you grasp the symbol, and as you do, you can see all of the scars across your forearm begin to light with a deep red crimson energy. Just <laughs> and you close your eyes, and as you look up, you can see Kosh's eyes just go straight black and this kind of dark energy begins to swirl off, and as it reaches out, it touches the diamonds, which then shatter upon impact, and the dark energy seeps into your sister's corpse. Oh my god. The back arches, though she does not register on the face or any of her movement, her body lifts slightly in place, her arms just kind of draped, dangling, and scraping against the stone beneath her as she's elevated there. How do you guys want to help with this ritual? So they're entering a skill challenge, a concept adapted from 4th edition. Three party members will have a chance to contribute by doing something to try to help the deceased character return to life. Usually Matt will not allow players to roll for the same skill over and over, so not everybody can cast a spell and roll arcana, or give a tearful speech and roll persuasion. As we'll see in future resurrection scenes, if anybody happens to die, I don't know, hypothetically, if two people make tearful speeches, one will roll persuasion, but the next will just have to roll a flat charisma check, because they're basically doing the same thing. Although very importantly, his players are very good about volunteering to do what their characters would actually naturally think to try, rather than just trying whatever skills they happen to have the most points in or whatever. Every successful skill check improves the chances for the final roll, reducing the final DC by 3. Every failure makes the final roll more challenging, increasing the final DC by 1. At the end of the ritual, Matt will factor in these modifiers and roll 1d20 to determine whether Vex will live or die. I take out th three of my shards of residuum and I place them and I place them in where the, where the crystals are as an extra offering. Okay, so the place the residuum across where the diamond dust was shattered yeah. and use that as almost a focus for the, the, the energy from the spell. All right, uh, I need you to go ahead and roll an intelligence check. Roll d20 and add your intelligence modifier. I'm gonna throw up. Oh no. Six. Six. Um, the energy itself vibrates within the glass shards, which then shatter, seemingly 
not able to uh, focus the energies of the spell. I take um, my enchanted moonstone from my staff and place it next to her. Okay. So as you take the moonstone and uh, what what are you are you speaking to your patron to aid with this? I am. All right. So as you take the moonstone and hold it aloft, you place it near the focus of Kasha's ritual. Um, the dull white glow begins to intermingle with the dark, shattered energy of Vesh's grant, and as they impact, it creates this strange gray swirl. Uh, I need you to go ahead and roll an Arcana check. 17. Okay. The gray balances, and where the two meet now, there is just gray energy seeping into her body. You, focusing, look up at the altar where the body was, and you see the very faint, drifting image of a dark female form looking on. So they've got one success and one failure, and the silhouette of someone watching. Matt is very strongly implying that it's Vesh, the evil goddess that Cash serves. Wants to make the third and final attempt at aid. I will I do. spot, oh, sure. I do. I'll let you do it. <laughs> I pull my sister in close, and I say, take me instead, you raven bitch. Go ahead and make a persuasion check. That's a good offer. With advantage. The way Matt's voice drops when he says that has stuck with me for seven and a half years. Eleven. Eleven. Okay. At this point, the dark female form that drifts from the altar, you glancing up intently, feeling the sudden, intense, fearful gaze of Vesh upon you. As it gets closer and closer, the presence is different. What you feared was Vesh is not Vesh, actually. It is an image, a specter of the Raven Queen herself. The face is formless at this proximity. You can't make any details. It's just this perpetually blurred female form of a face. The hair just tumbles down past. And as it steps forward, no expression, no words, the hand reaches out towards you, Vax. There's a nod. The magic strengthens, focusing through your moon crystal into, into Vax's body. Take a picture of this so that no one questions this. A moment passes. A second moment passes. The vision of the Raven Queen nods the head to you, steps backward, and the specter vanishes. <gasps> Breath fills Vex's lungs as she begins to cough. The form drifting back to the stonework. Your vision clears, and you find yourself looking up at the partially broken stone ceiling of the dark altar, into the face of your brother, tears streaming down his face. The rest of your friends gathered around. In the aftermath, there's just a lot of uncertainty. Liam has said since that he was expecting Vax to just drop dead right there. Oh well, it was a good run, time to roll up a new character. But clearly that didn't happen. He seems okay. Well, physically, emotionally, he seems a bit, well, he is not doing okay. Most of the jewelry was destroyed in the necrotic blast, but the armor is still there and there's also a small black crystal, so they take those and leave the tomb the way they came in. In the final moments of the episode, Will and Mary know they likely won't be able to join for any more sessions, so they say their piece. Zara gives Vex an arrow of dragon slaying that she crafted, and Keyleth and Cash have a beautiful conversation that's basically about how much Cash has grown, and he essentially gives Keyleth and Vex her, his blessing, for whatever that's worth. And so Keyleth and Cash are on pretty good terms now. It helps that they're also both deeply awkward people. Kima suggests that Keyleth send her back to Whitestone to meet up with the other allies, and invites Cash and Zara to come with as well. In fact, all of Vox Machina decides to pop back over to Whitestone for the night, just to decompress from the tough day they just had. Then they wrap up the game, and they do a little bit of a post-game talk about that thing that just happened. Uh, what did you roll? Did you roll a one? Which is a 12. A 12, okay. If you rolled a, what were you aiming for? The DC starts at 10. Each failure increases the DC by one, and a success lowers it by three. 
So uh, it had gone to 12, and the success uh, had brought it down to a nine. If I had rolled an eight or lower, oh, she wow. would have been gone for good. Oh, gee, oh, uh, all right. uh, well, she would have been I gone for been good. Gone. Mm -hmm. um, it, you would have had to have make, made a very, a very serious journey elsewhere, possibly, to make that exchange. Here, Matt basically just confirmed that if they had failed to resurrect Vex, they could have basically made a trip to the underworld to try to get her back. I mean, who knows what that would have looked like. They probably would have needed to find and talk to the Raven Queen and make some sort of deal, but I'm just generalizing and using the terminology from ancient myths. But the point is, if they'd failed to bring Vex back, that would not mean that Laura was screwed out of ever playing Vex again. Matt has clarified this much more recently, actually. He leaves it to the players to see whether they want to be brought back or roll up a new character. If they want to be brought back, there's a chance that it'll take a while and involve an intense challenge, like making a bargain with the Raven Queen in her own domain, but it will still be on the table, and that's an important part of Matt's approach to character death in his games. Laura also acknowledges that she was safely out of the blast zone, but her greed brought her into the sarcophagus radius, so yeah, she knows. And while we're dealing with this heavy subject matter, this is the time where I'll give you the context we didn't have at the time. I normally don't get into this level of depth into the personal lives of the players, but the video where Liam discusses this was pulled from YouTube for totally unrelated reasons, so I have no reason to assume he wouldn't want this information out there anymore, it just isn't out there in the same resource it normally was. Content warning. Real life death of a parent. If my memory serves me correctly, the reason they delayed this episode was because Liam was out of town for his mother's funeral. He since described it as occurring after this episode, but either way, this was clearly a very tough time for him. And just imagine what must be going through Liam's mind. Earlier this year, as his mother was already ill, his D&D game had him brought into conflict with the red dragon that killed his character's mother. And now, as he's dealing with the worst of it, his character's sister dies, and he offers his own character to take her place, but instead they both live. And the flood of emotions he must be feeling right now, I can't even begin to imagine. But the difficulty he's dealing with is going to wear on him for some time beyond this episode. And I don't want to get into spoilers, but I will say, this is the most important death in the campaign. Everything, everything would have been different if Vex had succeeded on that saving throw. I mean, sure, she walked over to look at the armor, and sure, Percy grabbed the armor without checking for traps, so no one can dispute that mistakes were made across the board. But honestly, it was just one bad roll. One bad roll changed everything. And if you don't know how yet, and you're watching these episodes along with us, well, you'll see. Thanks so much for watching. I've got some really excellent videos coming out in the next few days about dice rolls, and some other also excellent videos coming out in the next couple of weeks about death in your tabletop games. So if you want to stay up to date with all of that, then please subscribe and ring the bell so you can see these new videos as soon as they come out. If you'd like to see me take this video series weekly, support me on Patreon. Uh, if you're into hanging out with other cool people, come join my Discord server. And you know, I'm going to have a lot going on soon, so sign up for my newsletter to catch my updates, because uh, there's going to be a bunch of them. I'm finally taking my honeymoon a few days after you see this video. We didn't take one back in 2021 because it just didn't feel safe to travel, but once I'm back, I've got a lot of plans for some awesome stuff, so make sure to subscribe for those updates. Uh, one thing that's really important when running D&D is making sure your players are on the same page about your house rules, like if you're using resurrection skill challenges like Matt Mercer does. For more on that subject, check out my video about the Session Zero worksheet I use. Until next time, play fair and have fun.